Greetings everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes, my name is Phoenix. For those of you that are new to the channel, if you enjoy what you are hearing, please hit that subscribe button and set your notification bell to all. That way you don't miss every time I upload, which tends to be daily. If you are interested in becoming a member of the channel or would like to tip me with a coffee, all that information can be found down below. Now, with all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we rise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True Let's Not Meet Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. This experience happened about four or five years ago on a very hot summer night in a small town in the Midwest. My friend and I are hanging out one night, really late, when we decide we could really use some IHOP, mostly because it's the only 24-hour restaurant in the town and it was about 4 a.m. So I drive us there. On the ride, we are being super goofy because I think we're a little too tired and the idea of pancakes you know? All mirth is drained as we pull into the parking lot and see and hear a group of about seven men approaching the IHOP on foot. Our windows were down because it was very hot and my car didn't have AC, so we furiously rolled them up and sat quietly to see what they were going to do. I can't explain why we were so immediately scared. Probably just some drunk guys wanting some pancakes, right? Either way, we wait to gauge the situation instead of leaving the car to go inside. The men are obviously plastered drunk. Another detail is this IHOP is off the highway and quite far from all the residential areas and bars, so they would have had to have walked quite a ways from the closest bar to get there. Anyway, we are paralyzed just watching them, hoping they don't notice us in the car. They do. They start shouting and walking towards us. We lock the doors. They are banging on the window, shouting unintelligible drunken things. I turn the key in the ignition and start it driving off. They run after us. The chase was on foot for them, screaming obscenities, before we lose sight of them in the distance, after about a quarter of a mile. Seemed bizarre to me. Obviously, they weren't going to catch us, but they futilely run after us for that long. I don't know. Must have been the alcohol, but it scared the shit out of us. I think they must have been out of towners staying at a hotel since there were several relatively close to the IHOP. That would make more sense than them walking there all the way from in town. Luckily, that means we should likely never have another run-in with them. I'm going to go ahead and say sorry in advance. I was drunk most of the time during what happened, so I don't remember every single detail. When I was 18 and freshly broken up with my way older boyfriend, I basically went crazy with dating guys. At the time, I always dressed very goth, even going as far as to wear a real corset and trench coat, mostly just enjoying the attention. One particular afternoon, my friend roommate at the time decided to eat at a local Japanese restaurant, with both of us all dressed up. Our waiter was a mediocre, skinny, white guy who clearly was a little alternative, but it was hard to tell, really, with the uniform. We joked about me leaving my phone number on the receipt or something, so I hyped myself up and did it. Late that night, he had sent me a text. We talked for a few days, never really having a right time to meet up as I worked 40 minutes away from where I lived. He mentioned the boots he wore meant a lot to him and some other odd things that just seemed like edgy jokes. 
One really late night coming home, I was texting and driving, as any 18-year-old does, and we decided to meet up. My stupid ass invited him over to my apartment, where it was just me and the roommate, who had been with me before. Our other two roommates were not home. At first, it was fine because I was already drunk, so I would just let him rant about whatever he wanted. He went on about his life, going to jail, medical bills, his parents, etc. Eventually, he asked me if I wanted to see his tattoos, and I was like, all right. He lifted up his shirt, and not only could I see the handgun tucked in his waistband, but also his multiple badly covered up Nazi tattoos. One was even just slightly covered with a banana. I don't know what it was, but I simply decided the best way to deal with the situation was to appease him, so I went along with it casually. I don't remember exactly every detail because it was over two years ago and I was drunk, but he ended up pulling his gun out and pointing it at my head, asking me if I was scared. I was immensely confused and tried to call his bluff, saying I wasn't, which got him to put it away for a while. When we went to hook up in my messy ass room, he pulled it on me again, saying he wanted to do it with it out. I got mad and tried to fight him off of me and get it away from my head. Of course, I wasn't as strong as him and he hit me in the arm with it. But that shit hurt because it was a really nice one. When I finally got him off of me and he realized I was pissed, not scared, he started acting like a crackhead, saying I was crazy for not caring about him, pulling a gun on me. He ran off jumping the fence of the apartment complex and not even taking his car that he had came in. In the morning, his car was gone and I had a large bruise from where he had hit me. While to me it was a funny story, I now realized how bad it could have ended up. So, to the waiter from the Japanese restaurant, let's not ever meet again. Recently, there was an Amber Alert, and my daughter was asking me what that beeping sound was all about. For those who don't know, an Amber Alert goes out when a child is reported missing. If you receive notifications, you know what I'm talking about. The alert will sometimes give information like the victim's appearance, as well as the perpetrator, the location of the abduction, make and model of vehicle. My phone started beeping one evening while helping my daughter clean her room, an Amber Alert. She asked about it. I gave her a small rundown and that was that. However, it triggered a childhood memory I have where I believe with all of my heart that I was almost kidnapped when I was a kid. To be clear, this isn't a memory that was laying dormant in my subconscious and this random Amber Alert and talk with my kid caused it to resurface in my mind. This incident is something I've pondered and thought about off and on for years now. I'm 41 years old. I'm a male, by the way. It's just been a while since I've considered the factors and details of the experience. And this recent Amber Alert and talk with my daughter really caused me to pause and reflect on the incident itself once again, and here I am. As a parent, you worry about things and you do all you can to protect your children, especially when you've personally experienced something truly scary like this. The occurrence happened when I was just a young kid. My guess is around seven or eight years of age. I can't be sure, but I think that's a safe estimate based on the fact that much of those early childhood memories aren't there anymore. I do remember my kindergarten experience, which I would have been five or six, and also later grades. So, this incident must have happened sometime after or around the ages of seven to eight years of age. My parents took me to a neighborhood city to do some shopping. 
We lived in a small rural town with not much to offer, so from time to time we would go to the neighboring city about 45 minutes from where we were located. It just had more to offer. They would take me up there for school, clothes shopping, out to eat because restaurants are better and because my mom was a crafter. She loved to make crafts. It was her thing. There were different craft stores and a fabric store she liked going to all the time. This specific trip, we went to a fabric store up there, Joanne Fabrics to be exact. This was a pretty big store. As a little kid, I guess most every place seems big, but no kidding. This was a sizable store. My dad sat out in the car while I went in with my mom. He did that a lot you know, sit in the car. When there was a store, he didn't want to go in, so I can't blame him for that. I can't recall exactly what all my mom was looking for or trying to get in that store that day, but I do remember what section we were in, an area with a bunch of racks of various fabrics hanging. Imagine a clothing store with circular racks with clothes hanging all around them, and that's pretty much what it's like at this fabric store. Racks of hanging fabrics. I remember this area being slightly toward the beginning or entrance of the store. As my mom was looking through these racks, I began to wonder, though not far, just enough to kind of look around myself. I was probably bored and started wandering around. That's my guess. But I could still see my mom just up and over a few racks away, so it wasn't like I was on the opposite side of the store or anything. A random man approached me, and honestly, I can't really remember at what direction he came from. It's just like I was there by myself one minute, and the next, I looked up and saw this guy. It was like he came in fast and out of nowhere. I quickly looked over to where my mom was. She had moved a few racks up and away, but I could still see her. There was a fair bit of distance between my mom and me at this point. So, here I am, standing behind some rack of fabric with this older guy, opposite me in the other side of the rack. Then he speaks. Hey, little boy, how are you doing there? I remained silent because this took me completely off guard. He asked, Where's your folks at? Are you alone in here? I just stood still and quiet. Come here, I got something to show you. At this point, he started advancing towards me, coming around the rack to where I was. I quickly started the other way, but he stopped and started coming around the other way as if to meet me in the middle. I was scared at this point and became instantly aware that this man seemed dangerous and like he was trying to get a hold of me. Come here, he barked. I jerked fast to the left, but he did the same. He had this wild look in his eyes. Whichever direction I went, he followed, but remember, there's a rack between us God, I am so thankful for that rack. After some back and forth movements for me and this man, I finally lock in on my mom and yell, Mom, help! You would have thought I screamed bloody murder. It was so loud, but it got my mom's attention. Honey, what's wrong? She asked. This startled the man, and he looked over his shoulder in the direction of my gaze and confirmed. Yep. That must be his mother. His demeanor completely changed, and it's as if he is just having fun and games, and he was just messing around, and he said as much to my mom. <laughs> I was just messing around with him. No harm, ma'am. My mom came to where I was, and as we reconnected, the guy just tips his hat at my mom and makes his way out of the store. I explained to my mom what just happened, that this guy was trying to get me. I was so upset and still shook up. She told me I did the right thing by yelling and getting her attention. It was terrifying for sure, and I'm thankful something crazy didn't happen. 
could I have been imagining things like maybe this guy was really just messing around? I very much think there were nefarious intentions. Why would a random older guy be pursuing a fabric store? If he was there for something like crafts or fabrics, why promptly leave when confronted? I truly believe he was up to no good. Anyway, that's my story. I appreciate anyone taking the time to listen. Oh, and to the older man, I don't want to ever see you again. This happened about five years ago. I randomly just felt like I wanted to share the story with someone. I also hope this can help people in a similar situation. I had just gotten out of a two year long relationship. Living in the city, I moved to my then boyfriend for. After he left, I felt lonely and heartbroken. I was stuck in the apartment we had shared. I downloaded Tinder to chat to guys as a way of coping with the breakup. There, I matched with this guy. He was about four years older than me. He was extremely handsome and charming. He was very much into fitness and had an amazing body. After talking for a few days, he asked to meet, so we did. He came over to my house, and I was immediately attracted to him. He was a bad boy, the kind I usually fall for. But... He was also very sweet in the way he talked to me. He kept complimenting me and doing sweet stuff to me. After a few days of meeting, we ended up having sex, and it was honestly the best sex I've ever had. I felt this intense chemistry between us. We started hanging out and having a lot of sex. At the time, I did smoke weed a lot. I know he smoked too and did some other drugs. I didn't really care much at that time. Eventually, he would keep asking me to hang out pretty much every single day, begging me to come over because he missed me. When I told him I was too tired, he would bribe me with stuff, like saying he would give me massages, weed, dinner, romantic things, give me the best night, etc., etc. He didn't like it when I told him no. He would sometimes get angry and send me a bunch of messages just pleading for me to come over. After every time I had been to his house, he would shower me with love via messages. He was so romantic, saying I made him feel so amazing. There was something special about me and that he loved being with me. He would often shower me with compliments, but then get angry when I said I didn't have time to hang out with him. At some time, I was at his house. He got a phone call from someone. After he hung up, he told me I had to go upstairs and hide because his baby mama was coming over. He didn't want her to see me because she was fucking crazy. He told me some stories of how crazy she really was and some stuff that she had apparently done. I believed him. He was very convincing. I believe this happened twice. Now I know I should have seen the red flags. I probably did to some extent, but I didn't care much. I kept hanging out with him. A lot, even though I figured out he was heavy on drugs like cocaine and speed. One day, I was at his house and we had sex. I had smoked a lot. He was on coke and probably some other stuff. He wanted to have sex again, but he got frustrated that he couldn't get it up. He got mad and kind of blamed it on me, not being firm enough on the grip. He kind of yelled at me to squeeze it harder, and he just kept getting more and more frustrated. I felt really uncomfortable and wanted to leave, but he wanted me to stay. He tried to continue, but it didn't work. I was extremely uncomfortable and felt embarrassed. After a while, I told him I wanted to leave. He then told me to give back the weed he gave me, as is his mind. It was like his payment to me being with him. I honestly felt so pissed 
that I just grabbed my stuff and walked out the door. He followed me. At first, he walked calmly about 30 meters behind me, begging me to stay with him, asking where I was going. I kept walking and saying no. He then ran towards me. I picked up my phone to call a friend of mine because I could tell he was getting really aggressive. I turned around and saw him literally tear his shirt open and stomping towards me. He grabbed my phone out of my hand, then kicked me in my stomach so hard I fell into a ditch. He then smashed my phone to the ground and told me, You're done. I thought he was going to kick my ass, but then it looked like he was actually trying to contain himself for a second and just turned around and left. I was mortified by what he had just done. I ran away shaking. I can't even remember how I got home, but somehow I did. I was able to borrow a phone from someone and call my friend. He came over. I had bruises on my stomach and legs and had no phone. I also called the police using a friend's phone and told them I wanted to press charges. A few days later, he messaged me saying I tried to steal from him, that I took advantage of him just to get some weed. A few hours later, he texted me saying sorry. A few more hours, he texted asking what had happened to me yesterday. Then, a week later, he found out I had reported him to the police. He was pissed. He said he couldn't believe I reported him. Then, he told me he could give me two new phones or whatever I wanted if I withdrew the report. That he wouldn't contact me anymore if I just did it. He just didn't want any trouble and didn't want to lose his daughter. I didn't answer. Then, he sent another message fabricating the whole story of what happened that night. He kept harassing me for weeks with messages. Some days, he was begging us to get back together or just be friends, bribing me. Other days, he was accusing me of random stuff, calling me names, etc. And, of course, that he had a great lawyer that he would report me to the police for stuff I had never actually done. He kept acting like a smartass, saying he would beat me in court. It all just became a big clusterfuck of chaos. After a few months, there was a trial. I couldn't attend physically, so I testified via a phone call. I was questioned about our relationship and the incident that night. He lied and made up stories about me, but no one believed him. As the trial was done, I received all the papers in the mail. I was in shock when I read it. He had previously been charged with violence and rape towards his ex. Apparently, there was also an incident where he had forced his girlfriend to touch herself while multiple other men watched and videotaped her. There were other girls, too, that had experienced similar things. Stuff like robbery, weapons, fights, violence, and torture. You name it. He had been to jail multiple times. I had no idea I had been dealing with such a dangerous man. I am pretty sure he is a psychopath. He has no understanding of what he has done. The sick part is... I recently came across a post about him on Facebook. Apparently, he is pretty popular with women lately on Snapchat and Instagram. He posts stuff about his life, whining about being beat up by random men and being tortured and robbed, etc. That people follow him with guns. I have learned that the reason he keeps being beat up by people is because they know what he has done. He posted pictures of himself at the hospital to make people feel bad for him, and they do. He makes women feel sorry for him. He says people lie and make up stories about him and gains all this pity. He then posts all the sweet replies and messages girls send him, saying stuff like 
he feels so grateful for all the support. He is extremely good at manipulating people. I honestly feel so lucky that I got away at the time that I did, and that it didn't escalate any further. I checked his Facebook, and apparently he had a girlfriend now. I pray to God he doesn't hurt her the way he did me. I'm sorry if everything is not in order or something is missing. I just really, really had to get this out. And to the fucking psychopath that ruined my life almost. I hope I don't ever see you again. The Hester House was a legend passed down from class to class in my high school over the decades. Students and even teachers told a variation of a story about a house belonging to one of the earlier families in our community in central Pennsylvania that burned down a century earlier but reappears with the first full moon in October. The story was based on a real house that belonged to a family which owned much of the land in the county but sold it off for a residential and commercial development over the decades. When the house burned down in the 1950s, it took with it the last of the Hester family line. The problem was that no one knew where the house had been. There were some old foundations along the southern slope of Peters Mountain, but none of them could be linked historically to such a house. The only history was that of the suburban legend, which evolved over the years, of course. The one thing that remains constant was the promise of a treasure hidden under the floorboards in the house. If you found the house while it existed in our realm, you might find cash, gold, and jewels, enough to make you rich. Of course, if you didn't get out of the house before it disappeared, you would go with it and become a ghost inside its walls forever. Of course, this was the excuse used by high school kids over the years to go into the woods up on Peter's Mountain to camp or have a bonfire or really try to find the house. In the 1980s, it was still a time when parents didn't mind their kids being gone overnight, and none of us had cell phones. Overnight games of Dungeons and Dragons were common on weekends, and my gaming group was led by a kid who lived at the base of Peter's Mountain. He and his brothers loved the story of Hester House, and as October approached that one year, he took a break to persuade us to leave our tabletop adventure and go on a real one. We were a group of six boys aged 16 to 17, and it was easy for us to tell our parents we were staying over at Cliff's house for a marathon weekend of Dungeons and Dragons. Instead, we gathered camping material and agreed to head up the mountain to a small campsite Cliff knew, and, as the full moon rose over the mountain, to search for Hester House. One of these six of us, we lost the 16-year-old for lack of permission. We lost two more who just chickened out. So the three of us remaining had to split the gear, which put us behind schedule for the camp. The woods were damp and leaves were already falling across the trail, making the shallow uphill slippery and the steeper climbs treacherous. Getting up in the daylight was going to be fine, but after dark, there would be two miles between camp and Cliff's home and another three miles back to town. So we were committed. We reached the clearing where Cliff and his brothers, and a lot of Hester House seekers, made camp. It was a relatively flat area with a view down the mountain into the trees, but we were totally insulated by trees and cut off from the world by the sound of the forest with only the regular whistle of a distant train to cut through it. By the time we reached the camp, we had lost a half an hour and scrambled to assemble dry firewood, start a fire, and get the tent pitched. The wind rose from the west and cut through the trees, making our activities difficult. From there, things started to fall apart. 
There were poles missing from the tent bag. We would only find a limited supply of dried firewood to get the campfire started. The wind freshened and darkness swept over us as the sun set behind the mountaintop and clouds approached from that direction. The temperature plummeted from the mid-fifties while we worked up a sweat to the low forties with a chilling breeze. Cliff and I struggled to improvise solutions for the tent using branches to prop up walls and tying others to trees with nylon rope. Meanwhile, Keith fumbled and stumbled trying to get the fire lit, resorting to lighting an entire book of matches under the kindling in a gamble to get the fire lit and hot enough to dry out the moist firewood. We knew that any significant rain was going to put it out and we would be huddled together in our sleeping bags under a sagging tent all night. We abandoned the idea of searching for Hester House and prepared to weather a storm. Once we established some kind of camp, the rain held off for a while, just bringing a cool drizzle. We took turns maintaining the fire and threw shade at one another for not checking the equipment or planning for the weather and generally being miserable. As the light faded, we heard movement in the woods around us. Definitely human footfalls through the leaves and underbrush, we decided. It cut through the sound of dried leaves rustling and falling from the whistling wind through the trees and the updraft that blustered up the side of the mountain. Suddenly, a big object landed right in the middle of the campfire throwing hot embers and burning twigs in every direction, including our tents. The evening brightened in a dance of fireflies over the fire. We stepped out to find out what happened. Did a limb fall? Was it a wet branch popping with boiling water pockets? It was a rock the size of a baseball. Cliff pointed out the dark figure standing in the trees on the far side of the fire. It was a tall, husky figure standing slightly hunched like he was getting ready to charge or run away. Movement through the woods resumed and we detected three other people about 50 feet up and down the mountain around the campsite. The first figure we saw stood motionless for moments. Cliff yelled, more ticked off than afraid. Yo, who are you guys? Don't mess with the damn fire. The first figure started laughing. It wasn't another kid. It was an older, raspy laugh joined by other older-sounding voices and laughter. A soft ball-sized rock struck a tree trunk over my head and bounced off to one side. Another sailed over Keith's head and struck the ten snapping the branch, holding up the one side. We scattered. I don't know what the others were thinking, but I wanted to keep trees between me and as many of them as I could. The laughter intensified and more rocks landed in the campsite. I slipped on the wet leaves and slid down towards one of the men, and he rushed forward toward me, arms out. He was wide and slow juggling as he advanced and laughed like it was the funniest things he had ever done all year. He slipped and planted himself face first into the muddy ground. By that time, I had traction and was heading back up the slope toward camp. I took a small rock to the shoulder, but it glanced off my padded shoulder and I kept moving. I got to the camp and one of the men was standing right in front of the fire, his features still in shadow. He pointed at me and roared, Leave Hester House alone. He then took a couple of burning logs and tossed them into the tent. He ran off, chased by the others in the same general direction. Cliff and Keith rushed back. The tent was a loss. We had to smother it, and then it began to rain. A wall of rain rushed in from the west, and it poured so hard that it put out the fires and left us in the dark. 
We huddled together to be able to talk over the rain. Uh, are they gone? Where'd they go? What did we do? We had flashlights, and while cold and soaked, we were uninjured. Man, we gotta get out of here. We heard footsteps in the darkness, and a single beam of light shot out from the forest over us. The voice from before screamed, Leave the Hester house alone. Get out of here, or we will kill you. We abandoned our gear, except for our flashlights, and Keith led us away from the site down the mountain. We were moving at half the speed coming up. It was sloppy and slippery, and the rain was relentless. We slid on our butts over the steep parts and had to stop to work out a way down that wouldn't risk breaking our legs and neck. Every time we stopped, a rock would sail between us and snag against the other rocks or a tree, and a voice would shriek at us to go, or we will bury you on this mountain. <laughs> I want the skinny one. Ooh, she's cute. A rock hit Keith on the cheek and nearly sent him over an incline, but he dropped to his knees to keep from rolling. It dazed him, but his adrenaline kept him moving as the skin swelled and darkened. I said the first thing I could think of to Cliff. If these are your brothers and their friends, Cliff, I'm going to be seriously pissed. Cliff shook his head. Uh-huh, not them. They'd never do this. And, well, I believed him. But most of the town, dating back a generation or more, did know about the Hester House story and the date. It would be easy for someone who had bad intentions to come out into the woods on the first full moon and wait for a bunch of stupid, unprepared kids to make a camp far from witnesses. Suddenly, the stories about kids going missing inside the Hester house trying to get the treasure made us think if anyone actually did go missing on a dark night in the woods and the house was just a cover story too. A rock hit me between the shoulder blades with the power of a fastball. I felt something pop in my spine and a sharp shock up and down my entire body. After what felt like hours in the increasing darkness, dry heaving from the panic and the struggle, coughing and spitting up snot and rainwater, we came to the road close to Cliff's house. There was a man standing under the streetlight by the street. He had the same predatory hunch as the man at the campsite. Soon, three or four other figures appeared and blocked our way. We stopped and they began moving toward us. Suddenly, our silent prayers were answered when a truck rolled around the corner heading up the hill and bathed them in its headlights, blinding them. These were not kids or young adults. These were older men, faces in their 50s and 60s, bloated and wrinkled, covered in dirty clothes and windbreakers. They were ugly, evil-looking men who had worn us down to exhaustion and were ready to strike. The truck did not slow down, but it gave us a break. Cliff pulled us to one side of the path, and back into the woods, along a similar natural path along the road. With a supernatural reserve of strength, we cut through the barbs and brush like rabbits, eluding wolves, and came out scratched and scraped across the street from Cliff's house. The porch light was lit and the garage door wide open. Cliff's dad was working on something inside the garage, we heard the men chasing us along the road, but once they saw the lights of the house, they stopped. We didn't stop until we were in that garage yelling to Cliff's dad that there were bad men after us. Cliff's dad called the cops. Cliff's mom took us inside, dried us off, and helped tend to our injuries. The cops never found anyone, but they scolded us for being irresponsible enough to go camping in the woods 
without supervision or preparation. The sergeant there saved his strongest words for Cliff's parents, effectively ending our weekend Dungeons and Dragons games. Prevailing wisdom was that it was probably some old guys who lived over on the mountain who just wanted to scare some kids out on Hester House night, and they dismissed our dramatic interpretation of the peril, which was, in our minds, the product of our excitement and hormones. The newspaper took a decidedly Halloween approach to the story, spinning it as a tantalizing tale of transients stalking local kids on a camping trip with who knows what in mind when they caught us. But weird Hester House guardians in the woods. It's been 30 years, but if I'm ever in the neighborhood again, I hope we never meet because I will straight up murder you. This happened to a friend of mine who lived in the same neighborhood as me when we were about eight to nine years old. My friend, E, and her family lived just a few houses down the street from mine. We lived in a neighborhood where almost everyone knew each other. The biggest worry we ever had was that some outsider would come into the neighborhood and cause trouble. Some people left their homes unlocked because we felt that safe. There was an incredibly nice family that lived directly across the street from E's house. A mom, a dad, a 16-year-old son, and their other mentally challenged son who was 22 years of age. I'll just call him Tim. Tim was always home because he wasn't employed due to his disability. But his parents were working full time and his brother had school. All day, every day. He would be outside waving and smiling at anyone who drove or walked by. Big smiles showing all of his teeth and sometimes giggling just out of the pure excitement and happiness of interacting with other people since he spent most of his time alone. He was not creepy. One day, he was sick and didn't go to school. Even though she was only about eight or nine years of age, E was allowed to stay home sick by herself. Plus, her mom was going to be home at around 2 p.m. anyways, since she only worked part-time and the neighborhood was safe. E locked all the doors except the one that led into the garage. They used this as their front door because it was easier in those cookie-cutter homes to just open the garage, pull in, get out of the car, close the garage, and walk into your house through the unlocked door that led from the inside of the garage to the inside of their home. This is obviously not the safest way to protect your home from intruders, but we literally all did it, as if a flimsy garage door could keep anyone from getting into it if they wanted to. The worst part is that they had a outdoor cat and kept the garage door cracked, just enough for him to get inside for his food and shelter if he needed it. So ease asleep, feeling sick with a fever. All the doors and windows were locked, except the door leading to the cracked garage door. Tim was bound to know she was home alone since he was outside the front of his house all the time. E wakes up to pounding on the front door. Startled, she walks downstairs and looks through the peephole. It's Tim. She cracks the door, and he says something along the lines of how he notices everything and would guard her home since she's home alone. She said thanks, but there was no need to, and to have a good day. It was beautiful weather. He looked pissed. He got angry and said, You think I can't do it because I'm dumb, but you watch and see because me ain't dumb. She said sorry, and she didn't mean it like that, but she had to rest now. She dozed off and woke up to a noise downstairs in the kitchen, the room the door from the garage led into. 
She hadn't heard the garage door open, but she was sick, so she figured she was deep in sleep and just hadn't noticed. Completely disoriented from time, she looked over at the alarm clock. It was 10.20, way too early for her mom to be home. At that moment, she heard noises again downstairs. She didn't call out. She had been sleeping in her parents' bedroom and ran into their bathroom, slamming the door loudly. Then she remembered their bathroom door had no lock on it. The noise she made slamming the door alerted the intruder to where in the house she was at, and big footsteps started coming upstairs. She moved quickly and quietly to her parents' closet, which was on the other side of the big room. She closed the doors and hid behind some clothes, all the time thinking how someone would have gotten inside. She remembered that the garage door was cracked for the cat, slightly, but not close enough for a thin person to slip underneath. Tim walks into the bedroom. Tim is tall and very thin. She can see him through the slated closet doors. She sees he's holding a knife and did everything she could not to scream. He quickly went to the master bathroom where she was just moments before. These cookie cutter houses only had about three, four plant layouts, so it wasn't hard for him to find. He looked inside the bathroom and didn't see her. Then started making loud throaty noises like someone would if they're frustrated and angry while pacing the entire house. She stayed in the closet for hours, even after she heard him exit through the front door. She stayed until her mom got home. She was crying hysterically and told her mom what happened. Had she not been so upset and had one of their kitchen knives not been left in the front door, her mom might have blamed it on being delirious from the high fever because nobody would expect Tim to do such a thing. The police were called and an official report filed. I'm not sure if he had any charges pressed against him because after she told me the story once, she refused to talk about it again. I overheard her parents a few times talking about the situation to my own parents, but Never heard what the consequences were. E was so traumatized. She went to therapy afterwards for several years and still wouldn't talk to anyone about it because she didn't want to answer or relive the experience. We even moved into an apartment together years and years later for college purposes. She never talked about Tim. It was like he never existed and I never asked. I noticed she always locked the front door, which you should do, of course. Always locked the door that led to the patio and balcony, even though we were on the seventh level, and always locked her bedroom door, onto which she added an additional lock. And when she locked all of these doors and the windows, she always checked three times, every single time. I often wonder if there was more to the story than what E told to me. We were kids after all, and sometimes kids don't know how to explain things they don't understand. It is terrifying to think about what his intentions truly were, and if he perhaps did find E and something else happened. As horrifying as the experience must have been for her, it made a huge statement in the neighborhood for everyone to be more careful. I will always make sure everything is locked. I don't ever want to meet you again, Tim. This happened when I was back in high school. It was a Wednesday night. Usually on Wednesdays, I would have a youth group at my church and my mom would have date night with her mom, where they'd go play cards or watch TV together, etc. This would mean that we'd be gone until 9 or 9.30 every Wednesday night. For whatever reason, both of us decided to stay home this night. 
I was downstairs in my mom's room in the basement watching TV with her. We also had a roommate at this time, and Cinnamon was his dog. The roommate was gone this night. He was the night owl. So when he was gone, Cinnamon would sleep with one of us. I slept on a full-size futon frame at this time, so even though it was a tight fit for myself and a big old pit bull, I always took the opportunity to have her sleep with me. She was, and is still, a great dog. It was about 8 or 8.30. Keep in mind, we usually wouldn't be home at this time, and our roommate was not home either. And I decided to head to bed. The way our house was set up was you go to the top of the stairs, hit a landing, and then go up another set of stairs, and you'd be looking through the kitchen and living room, and you could see the front door. So, Cinnamon and I walking up the stairs to my room, and we hit the landing. As soon as we do, Cinnamon barks a loud bark and books it up the other flight of stairs. I look up and see her booking it through the kitchen, and as I do, our front door bursts open, swings wide, and hits the wall and I see a man in all black, with his hood up and black gloves on, running out the door frame, through our porch and entryway, down our front steps and away on the sidewalk. Cinnamon stood barking at our screen door to our porch. It was a fast, loud, shocking event. It was winter and pitch black, so I didn't see much else, because it was dark and happened so fast, but... I ran over and slammed the front door shut and locked the deadbolt and then took Cinnamon and went to my room and locked my bedroom door. I called my mom and I told her what had happened from upstairs and she just told me to lock the door and stay in my room. That night, I didn't sleep much. I was keeping an eye out for any noise or footsteps outside my window and I swore I heard something, but ultimately... Nothing else happened. I spent the night snuggled up to Cinnamon, thanking her for protecting me and being a scary pit bull, even though she was so gentle, and I do mean always, and I'll never forget that. So, to the man who broke into my house as I went to bed, I'm glad we never met again. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Let's Not Meet stories. Before I continue, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Christy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's Niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all, yet again, for being the pillars on which Back to Ashes stands upon. To the other subscribers and other supporters, thank you as well for supporting this channel, for without you, I would not have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.